absolutely the last lecture of this series called The Triple Double. And I somehow suspect that Francois did a trick <laughs> to be the very last one to talk. Uh, uh, I mean, it's appreciated, of course. Uh, it was, um, being part of the finissage. finissage yeah. uh, now, uh, I don't know if there's really a lot of reason to reintroduce uh, Francois Charbonnet, who, I mean, and I don't think I exaggerate, but at least, anyhow, I don't exaggerate. My personal opinion is by far the best architect in Switzerland at this time. I mean, which is not so easy, you could say, because it's full of idiots, uh, also true. Uh, but, um, but, I mean, no, even there's some, a couple of very good ones. Of course, of all the generation, we have a few, we know. But I think he makes a difference on, on what architecture could be in Switzerland, actually, which I think is weird because uh, uh, there's something like a, a kind of consensus about mm. what it already was. Mm. And I'm happy you bring that to uh, So, well, apart from that, I think we, we share, I mean, most, most of us here at the Forum, uh, absolute fascination, if not obsession, for Jean Nouvel. It does not mean we love unconditionally everything, but I guess that's for you to say. Um, so, but we are curious uh, mm -hmm. how you deal with that. Okay. Uh, Thank I, you. I saw, I saw a kind of crazy, um, what was it, a DVD you could buy uh, uh, in Boza in Brussels. Yeah. Uh, com but with a conversation between Jean Nouvel and Daniel Buren. And it was uh, typically in the French, it was called Grande Conversation. Yeah, Grande Conversation. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> let's have our Grande Conversation. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. <laughs> well, uh, thank you for the invitation. I suspect there was a hidden agenda when you choose uh, the double, right? And um, I didn't really know how to cope with this issue because um, I have a tr sincere fascination for the work of Jean Nouvel, but I had to dig a little bit in the past to see really what uh, interested us. And I didn't really know what kind of strategy I would use in order to present uh, this difficult double. The first thing I want to say is that he's only a difficult double. He's not the only difficult double we have. And um, that accounts for the multiplicity of the doubles uh, we seem to actually have affinities with. Huh? The second question would be how difficult this double is. And I didn't find it very difficult. But, but I realized that in the course of the elaboration of the presentation, the presentation is done in two parts. Um, the first part, <laughs> so yes, there is an affinity, there is something going on between the two. Although I've never met John Nouvel, uh, I don't know what kind of a person he is or anything like that. I know he's always late, which I respected, because I was supposed to give this lecture two weeks ago. <laughs> We're late today, I was late two weeks ago, so I'm kind of a, a dope thing, let's say, uh, the attitude of John Nouvel. Uh, what you see here on this picture is, of course, the body of Jean Nouvel. We changed the watch, the cigar, the head is that of my associate, Patrick Heitz, and uh, the glasses are mine. Uh, basically, this is it. But as I said, uh, in the process of the uh, elaboration of this uh, short lecture, which might not become really short, that's the other thing, as I said, it was going to be in two parts. The first part is going to be somehow trying to read the work of Jean Nouvel through the topics that Maiden seems to be interested in. And the reason for which I say this is that you're never going to see a single image of our work. I'm only going to present work by Jean Nouvel, which I find affinities with. Yeah. Uh, I disagree, you know, I, I, I don't feel close to every approach he has, but there's been uh, interesting topics addressed by Jean Nouvel, let's say in the 80s, 90s, and beginning of the 2000s. You can see here, this is my Alcocis. My father uh, subscribed, uh, bought me a subscription after the first year of my studies. And uh, you can see with the marking of the pages, uh, it's been uh, one issue that has been used all over the studies. Uh, a bit less afterwards, but uh, it hasn't been open for 15 years now. But I realized that I had been scratching and searching through this book for a very long time. As I said, it's not the only one. There's one that is completely trash trashed. It's the one by Ram Koras. All the others are pretty neat and new and fancy. Uh, the second source is that uh, Grande Conversation <laughs> between uh, Jean Baudrillard and Jean Nouvel about his Objets Singuliers. And I think it accounts to a certain extent for this very Latin approach to architecture and this also very French approach. There is an 
artificial inter intellectualism. I call it artificial because I don't think Jean Nouvel is an absolutely uh, sharp intellectual. He's a sharp architect. There's no doubt about this. He's uh, very often been said that he was a man of word uh, and not of writings, you know, it's just uh, oral words, which I cannot confirm because I've never met with him in a certain way. But there are some interesting points here. What is interesting to see in this, for those who have read this dialogue, is that you realize that Jean Baudrillard, and this is very often the case, I also point out to another dialogue, which is extremely interesting, which has nothing to do with architecture, between Jean-Pierre Changeur, who is a neurobiologist, and Paul Ricoeur, who is a, a Protestant philosopher. And you realize that between the scientist and the philosopher, the philosopher always stands above. There is always a relationship that is undermining, basically, the scientists or the approach of, of the pragmatist. And it becomes obvious when you read Jean Baudrillard and Jean Nouvel, the accuracy of the sayings uh, by Jean Baudrillard are much, much closer to a certain reality than those of Jean Nouvel. Nevertheless, it's an interesting exchange, I think, between two, uh, two uh, very important figures of French culture. And the last one was this issue of l'architecture d'aujourd'hui, uh, that was published in 1994. It's an interesting issue. It's not the first issue, issue that uh, L'Architecture Aujourd'hui uh, uh, dedicated to Jean Nouvel, but this is one of the latest ones. And it was published in 1994 when Jean Nouvel really started to become this overwhelming figure, not only in France but worldwide, because he had finished several buildings, as you know, the uh, Fondation Cartier, L'Institut Monarab, and so on. So, just to show you that it's been part of our education at Maiden, it's still very much alive, <coughs> but mostly unconsciously, I would say. And we'll start by actually uh, trying to define a certain amount of frameworks. I will not get into all the details. These are more intuitions than they are really, uh, let's say, uh, proved uh, facts. I would say that John Nouvel's work is about science, and which would somehow account for the connotative framework he's dealing with. And what I did is that I simply, which is quite unused, uh, well, not usual, for Jean Nouvel, instead of showing images, I will show images, of course, but I started to actually select also in some quotes and some text he had written uh, for this architecture d'aujourd'hui. And here's what he says about science. Is anyone still interested in structural truth? Aren't the formulas hacked or lost? Haven't the archetypes been made ridiculous in that similar craft? Architecture is more and more interested in the living. Architecture receives and holds the signs of life. Its new dimensions are interactive, time, speed, lights, intensities, materials, touch, and signs, images. That is, if I really uh, respect what he's trying to say, he understands signs as images. In our practice, we don't only understand signs as images, but he basically mostly understands signs as images. What would still be interested, made it, would still be interested in time, of course, to speak, much less by lights and materials, which are, I think, let's say, secondary topics, not only in the work of genre, but mainly in our work. Uh, images. Let's look at uh, what kind of images he's <coughs> produced. Many of them are very well known. It is always associated with certain understanding what the images are. And here, of course, here are the ship, the metaphor of the ship is extremely, an extremely important one. His ability. Um, to create sign at a, at, a, at a grand scale. Scale plays an enormous role here in the case of the Opera House in Lyon, or the interior of the house, to reconquer the almost nostalgic and romantic feature of the Opera House, where in an Opera House one can actually be seen and hide at the same time. There are very beautiful examples in, uh, in literature of this uh, constant negotiation between being seen and not being seen in an Opera House, namely in post uh, is one of the best examples that you can see. Um, and he has very well coped with this idea of the theater. He's been uh, very much involved in what a theater uh, should become in the 21st century, or has been. Uh, another sign here, we'll come back to that, uh, that idea of this tower sans fin, the tour sans fin. Or of course, the analogy with the aircraft carrier, uh, this ability also to, let's say, look at weapons, or let's say the military features beyond moral which are also very much interesting. And you know, what he's trying to say also, I read in an article that he thinks that everything that comes into our daily lives has been somehow been tested by military features to a certain extent, and I think that's an interesting idea, beyond moral. Of course, his ability to produce images that reveal a certain authority, here in the case of uh, uh, Le Palais de Justice de Nantes. <coughs> you can see here 
the weight of the justice of the authority, which is very much also kind of a 19th century uh, idea. You know? and it's not coping with very new signs in a certain way. In this case here, the authority is very clearly uh, expressed by means of dark material, the assembly, and the authority of the portico. Other types of images, almost literal images, in the case of the Hotel in Lucerne, were screenshots, uh, shots of uh, stills of uh, very famous movies dealing with erotic, we'll come back to it, are being stamped onto the ceiling. Or in the case of a very beautiful project in the rehabilitation of St. Mary Church in Dordogne, where uh, uh, the uh, uh, tympan, the tympanon uh, uh, of the church is being raised to a monumental size by means of the gigantic doors. The second topic I think John Valley is dealing with is prosthetics, which would account for the performance framework. <coughs> the architectural support will be increasingly sophisticated. It will integrate high, the most highly evolved extensions of functionality, miniaturization, mechanization. It will create spaces to be lived in that are climatically controlled and product programmed, and other people are specialized. Technology is no longer the enemy of nature. Of course, here he calls upon this idea of sustainability, but I think it goes way beyond this. In the case of uh, an example of the Institute of Monahab, this is very clear that technology and, uh, has been used uh, to stage a certain, not only a performative aspect, of course, to stage something. Right? In this case, uh, he's been very much criticized by the fact that this expensive facade doesn't work which is not true. Uh, he gave a lecture at the ATI in the early 90s and said that basically these engines that actually drive this facade have been developed by NASA and they perfectly work. They simply do not use them. It's as simple as that. So uh, the diaphragm does not work as such because they refuse to use them for several reasons. I don't exactly know, but every engine has been tested by NASA and still works. Uh, this apply application of technology onto a built facade it's quite a fascinating one. I said prosthetic, prosthetics not only dealing with performative aspects, but always with staging and conflict, and always this negotiation between accesses and really the image it is produced by. Or in the case of the hotel in Florac, with the pistons allowing the facade to open itself towards the landscape. Or here, a typical feature that I would have, could have also imagined, this uh, tipping roof that you can totally open. You can see here the inheritance, technological inheritance within the space, or the staging of those capsule lifts in the uh, in uh, Fondation Cartier. But the best example of this is, of course, this competition that he lost for the Stadium of the World Cup 1998. This is a long story. Um, he was basically uh, shortlisted as, two, as one of the two finalists for the stadium, and he lost. But the reason for which he lost, he was very, very much upset, apparently, uh, when he lost this competition. And uh, the reason for which he lost, he said the person who finally decided for who was going to be uh, building the stadium was Edouard Balladur, which is a moderate right-wing uh, politician, old school, he's now 75 years old. And it was pretty obvious that this Balladur, which was somehow, uh, let's say, it comes from an aristocratic family, old French family, could not cope with the rock and roll attitude of this Jean Nouvel. He was really pissed off to the point that he went to court. And uh, he won his case against Balladur. Of course, he didn't build the stadium, but his honor was saved. So, and this stadium has a particularity of being a true machine. It can transform itself in many ways. It can accommodate half a stadium for tennis. It can accommodate a track and field uh, stadium. It can accommodate, of course, a football stadium, the roof itself. So it's almost like a toy, right? And the repertoire he uses is quite a fascinating one, but of course it's not an architectural one. It's a totally industrial one. So you can see here all the details. It's basically the stadium is built up of several gantry cranes. Gantry cranes are very much used in harbor situations. That you know that many harbors in Europe, and the whole stadium is basically uh, built upon this elementary feature of the gantry train set onto uh, Teflon wheels, and you can move every tribune away from each other in order to create those different uh, uh, layouts. Uh, this is a fascinating stadium. Not even the United States have been able to really develop such a kind of a stadium. 
it's still uh, a stadium that we would love to be seen. I think I would love to see the stadium built because I think it coped with this idea of what a stadium could be today, let's say in the consciousness uh, of our societies. And probably these are the new cathedrals of our time. It's been said many times before, but let's say, if you look at the horizon, this has become something most evident today. Uh, the third framework would be that of the antagonizing one, which is that of politics. And I have here uh, a quote by Jean Nouvel, and I will then show you how he's been received by the rest of the press. City planning is dying with this century, the 20th century. We have to stop stupidly applying the same simplistic administrative regulations to territories, and governmental irresponsibility has to stop. City planning is becoming a synthesis of territorial strategies, a demanding political and democratic synthesis generated by strong analysis on the old model of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Exploiting singularities, enhancing differences, what can we do have accepted that we wouldn't be able to do enhance elsewhere? So his strategy is a very clear one. City building is about enhancing differences. But of course, this is not a taste of everyone. This is... <laughs> This is uh, an excerpt and a highlight of, a, uh, of an article published about John Nouvel, and it says the following thing. Méfions-nous particulièrement de Nouvelle. Il est à la mode et construit de plus en plus de choses de plus en plus laides, puisque personne ne l'arrête. On ne juge plus tant les gens sur leur tête, et c'est fort dommage. Nouvelle est jeune, chauve et laid. Son sourire n'est qu'un rictus cruel. Sa méchanceté se lit dans ses yeux cupides. L'ensemble est asiatique. C'est un Mongol, un, un destructeur de civilisation, et nous n'avons plus de sainte geneviève pour arrêter les Attila. That's a strong charge, but it shows how polarizing uh, uh, not only his architecture, but his personality is in the landscape of globalized architecture. And this is, of course, a French uh, article, but you can see that also not only in France. But so he, he basically builds up tension around his project, and I think he does it consciously. It's been said many times, of course, the latest uh, project that was canceled was, uh, was uh, the extension of the Musée des Beaux-Arts, uh, Musée des Arts in Geneva, where you can see he's been depicted <laughs> as a, some sort of a Dracula. And he has a little bit of that, of course, but what I appreciate about this is that he's able to engage into political uh, uh, statements and he's not afraid to engage into uh, these discussions. The latest one, of course, is out of the Philomenae. I'm not going to talk about the project itself, but of course this has been as loud as it could ever get. He boycotted the opening of the Philharmonic, but it shows how much this guy has been able to stand on his, firmly on his position. And let's say, I'm sure he's an optimist, but to a certain extent he's able to stand by his position, which I highly appreciate. The fourth framework, which would be that of manipulative framework, with that of illusions. And we think that illusions are extremely important in his work. And he says it very blatantly. Being an architect in the 20th century has meant inventing reality on a clean slate. Being an architect in the 21st century will mean manipulating reality. This manipulation, and I will come back to that. The reality of the mass of shapeless urban material, the reality of the industrial production of consumer goods. So you can see here in the statement, he's very much aware of what society he's living in, what time he's living on. And he's certainly aware of today, it's not about so much about inventing a reality, but manipulating it. And by manipulation, I mean that, of course, he puts the architect in the position of the manipulator, almost as a, a let's say, a, some sort of magician, and trying to not completely, uh, let's say, be totally transparent about what he's trying to do, but keep a very, a very uh, discreet way also of manipulating things. Uh, I said discreet because it doesn't seem to be that discreet, but of course there is a layering of information that one can read in his work, and I think this manipulation accounts for a very, very much his versatility in his work, his ability to actually cope with several contexts. We'll come back to the issue of the context afterwards. Here in the case of the Parc de Paris, of the renovation of the um, Les Fouilles uh, du Paris de la Cathedrale de Chartres, where basically the built substance seems to disappear in order to guarantee this view uh, of the Cathedrale de Chartres. Or in the Foundation Cartier, or the Cartier Foundation, which is most obvious with the angle and time of the day, where the image of the building, its transparency is constantly changing. These are topics we've heard and heard again and again in the 90s. He's not the only one to have addressed these issues. And one of the last topic I think I would like to define the work of Jean Le is that of desires, uh, yearning. It seems to be an awkward topic, but I think it accounts for its contextual framework. 
at a time where Rem Kulas, a famous figure, tried to kill what he described as context, and he said, fuck context. Of course, there was a reason for which Rem Kulas mentioned fuck context. Jean Nouvel constantly opposed this idea of fuck context, eh? and very openly also uh, in discussions with Rem Kulas, but except that his idea of the context is a very different one. Eh? The context is that of a desirable one, a desire one. In other words, in order to define the context, I will try to, uh, let's say, quote this uh, short uh, text by Jean Nouvel, and then I'll come back to define what the context, I think, is for himself, and it's very much deeply rooted in French culture. To be authentic is to reveal and to denounce deficits in sensitivity on most of construction sites. Deficit in art, deficit in delight, which essentially stems out of a deficit in desire. As a consequence, to be authentic is to be committed to emotionally arouse, to convey a desire, an original one, as opposed to duplicates, embracing the conscious acuteness of the people and of the place. And I think if one were to be, here's an example, I think, of one of the most phantasmagoric uh, projects of his, where once, or let's say, the absolute phallocratic idea of a tower this tower without an end. One of the last very beautiful idea of the very common uh, uh, understanding what a tower is, this tower is as high as possible, it's as high even that it doesn't have an end. This is a fantasy where he projects his own desire uh, onto a project that has never been built, of course. This is a shame, but at the time it was the slenderest projected tower in the world on a relationship, a ratio of 1 to 10. Engineers tend to say that now, today, you could go to 1 to 11, 1 to 12, but this is the limit of Paris. And of course, also uh, addressing the issue of this Grand Paris with the uh, uh, perspective between the Arc de Triomphe, the Champs Elysees, uh, the Parc des Tuileries, and so on. But in order to define what this context is, as I said, it's not necessarily a built substance context. I think one has to quote the entire Oedipus by. Gilles Deleuze and Félix Gattari in order to understand what this means. The great discovery of psychoanalysis was that of the production of desire, of the production of the unconscious. But once Oedipus entered the picture, the discovery was soon buried beneath a new brand of idealism. A classical theater was substituted for the unconscious as a factor. Representation was substituted for, substituted for the units of production of the unconscious, and an unconscious that was capable of nothing but expressing itself in myth, tragedy, and dreams, was substituted for the productive unconscious. So, how do they understand, Félix Attari and, and Gilles Deleuze, this idea of desire? And in what sense does it become the context for Jean Nouvel? Félix Gattari and uh, Gilles Deleuze have been very much uh, nervous about uh, everything that has been developed by Freud regarding the unconsciousness. And they say, one never wishes one thing. You never wish a lady. You never wish a car. You never wish a painting for itself. That's totally new, what they tried to say. They said the following thing. They said, the unconsciousness, the unconscious is not a theater. It's a factory. It's constantly producing. And what it does, it creates agencement, fixed agencement of desires of objects, between which the desire literally flows. In other words, they're saying that you do not wish a car. You wish a car within a certain condition, within, on a certain road, with a certain lady, with a certain context. And this context is not only a built substance is not only an architectural one, it's an emotional one, filled up with designs. I think Jacques Herzog and Jean Nouvel are the closest to what they describe this unconscious factor being projected onto built substance. And the last one I'd like to say is the last uh, framework I would define is that of a constructive framework, which is not a pulled one, but the assembly. All these major works are basically being assembled. So you can see here in the case of the Institute Moraha, this is almost even most obvious in the Philharmonie. You can see here that everything is being assembled, nothing is continuous <coughs> in the space, everything is being mounted together. So, having said those, defined those five or six topics, I would like to present one project as a conclusion, which I think is one of the best projects of genre, at least I find extremely close uh, to this project for several reasons. 
I wish I had been able to actually develop such a project. It's been done, so it's not to be done again. But it's a fantastic project. You will see that all these topics have been somehow embedded into uh, the process of development of this project. Nemausus, I call it prototyping social housing. In order to describe it, I have to go through a very short and quick social history of social housing in France. In order to show how much Nemausus is basically part of this lineage of uh, idealistic uh, approach of social housing in the context, the given context of France. I'm not going to describe everything, or of course, one of them being uh, Claude Nicolas Ledoux and his Salle Royal d'Arc et Senon, the Palancère of Charles Fourier, the Family Stair Jean Baptiste Godin, La Cité Industrielle de Tony Garnier, La Cité de, Muette, de la Muette by Baudouin and Loda. As I said, these are not, have not been chosen for the qualities, but just to show how much massive production of social housing has been an issue in the development of French architectural culture. L'unité d'habitation in Nantes by Le Corbusier, Montparnasse, La Grande Borne, Les Choux de You can see they've been extremely inventive also in terms of architectural forms. And of course, one of the most famous ones. Antigone Montpellier by Ricardo Boffi. One has to realize what social housing means in France uh, uh, in order to really understand what, how good a project like the Mausers is. Um, there are 4.5 million social housing units in France, which represent about 16% of the total built substance on the, uh, uh, in the country. It harbors 10 million of people yet 70% of the poor population is eligible for social housing in France. Shows you the enormous political issue that is at stake in France. These are kind of old numbers, but I doubt that with the government they have today, these numbers have drastically changed. So 70% of people living in France are eligible for social housing. And uh, <clears throat> this project of Inamazos was triggered first uh, through uh, a competition for the Carida, which was an international competition launched in 1984. This is La Maison Carré in Nîmes. And Jean Nouvel proposed something very dear, and he basically proposed to develop the project underground. And you can see uh, the audacity at the time in 1984, basically uh, removing all the foundation of Maison d'Arme, building the whole museum onto a glass pavement ceiling, which were to become public revealing really the foundations of what the work was. He got, of course, he caught the attention of one man who was extremely important, that accounts for also the political attitude of Jean Nouvel, namely Jean Bousquet, who was a left-wing socialist mayor of the city of Nîmes at the time, and he was fascinated by the proposal of Jean Nouvel, and he didn't win the project, so he said to Jean Nouvel, like, look, here's Jean Nouvel at the time with still a bit of hair. He said, I didn't win the project, but I'll give you another one, do whatever you wish, whatever you wish, carte blanche, absolute carte blanche for social housing on a given site. This is the given site in Nîmes, Les Entrepôts, which is an old factory for electrical fixtures. You can see here uh, the former situation of the site and the project by Jean Nouvel, which is a drastic proposal for social housing in a given context. So how is it built? You've got basically a parking lot based on a very rigid structure. And of course you can see the accumulation of signs also. You can see in the section that this parking lot is not set to the ground level, but slightly excavated in order to provide uh, uh, no obstacle in the view at ground level. It's full of industrial and also uh, industrial signs and also connotation of the industrial assembly. <coughs> It harbors 140 housing units, 14 housing units. Also an extremely different, we will see there's a whole study about typologies. It's a very simple structure, extremely economical, built on top of each other. You can see here the different types of apartments. It ranges from two bedroom apartments to five bedroom apartments to studios on one level to triplex in three levels, of course. And this, as I said, as uh, the sign of the colors being basically the layout of the program is being used 
as a main feature for the facade. In order to enhance the readability somehow of the program behind this. Here's another statement by Jean, a beautiful apartment is a large apartment, a beautiful room is a large room. Obviously, what does it stay here? Is the simplicity of the size of the apartment. And it did that. Uh, as such, social housing standard exceed, we're being exceeded by 30 to 40 percent. Uh, so it's not just fine words, it's also a reality. You can see here several types, single bedroom, very inventive way of dealing, of course, with the central core, extremely flexible. We'll come back to the features uh, uh, towards the outside. Very joyful layouts also of apartments. This is the, the end apartment at the end of the building. Extreme heights, and extremely luxury heights, I would say, in social housing. You can see here also the complexity of the types. I'm sorry for the quality of the picture that were taken from the documentary on uh, Nim houses, so it's a low resolution project and low resolution images. He also enhanced this idea of, politically speaking, more ethics, less aesthetics. Of course, this is a very instrumentalized quote because you can see here uh, that it has very little to do with more ethics, but uh, a lot to do with aesthetic, of course, the impoverished aesthetics in this case. But I think it is kind of fascinating to see how we manage by exposing and exhibiting all the pictures to somehow cope with a certain idea of a certain ornament or a certain understanding of what is going on within the buildings themselves, using again within the repertoire industrial fixtures. Huh? You can see here all the roughness of the l'état brut uh, of the building itself. But I'll come back to those red lines and basically all these things, these red lines and all these things that actually reveal a certain construction uh, event have been added afterwards. You can see how much he projects also uh, this idea that uh, uh, everything had to be left as a brutal uh, aspect was actually somehow embedded afterwards uh, once the building was finished. But what I want to point out here, of course, seems extremely uh, after Pavel, extremely uh, modest as a picture, but the luxury of it, and I think that's where I think there, he copes with this uh, uh, quote about more, more ethics, less aesthetics, is that uh, uh, in a social housing apartment to have a bathroom with a large window is an extreme luxury. In this case, I think uh, that would be a, a wonderful example of how he could cope, let's say, by abandoning, uh, abandoning certain features of social housing, reconquer some qualities, or let's say, more luxurious architecture. The mass is also, also full of performative infrastructure, prosthetics, as I mentioned. You can see here, you know, not to disturb the exploitation of the whole surface, all access, access have, have been set outside of the building, and you can see also the differences in the cross-section between what this idealistic approach of the Mausers with the other idealistic approach of modernism, where the street is an inside street, you can see here the distribution street is an inside street, a very gloomy one, uh, no matter what the colors may appear to be. Uh, and on the other side, you have the project by Jean Grand, where the street has been set outside. Much more lively perspective and a much more successful way of dealing what has turned to become a playground, and not only a distribution space, but also a playground. It's an extremely polarized way of dealing with infrastructure and stage in a way where socials and, and people can actually encounter themselves, not only uh, as they are entering their apartment, also as they are living, literally living. You can see here, also, the analogies with the metaphors of the industrial features being used, again, in the coursey of the apartment. One has to also point out this polarization between private, intimate, and public. You've seen the street on the other side of the building. The whole facade is being uh, 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 accommodated by private terraces. Problem. Next slide is not common. So technology is not the enemy of nature, but it's my enemy. Uh, start. That's it. Uh huh. Yes. Okay. 
is next. You can see here, these these basically uh, railings on the ground floor have been added in 2010, I think, later, much later on, reusing basically the same repertoire as it was above because people were actually throwing cans and trashes into the thing. This remains social housing and not a very, you know, in a not very wealthy uh, part of Nîmes. So uh, they managed to actually cope with this, the, with the project 20 years later in a very elegant way, I also think. Mm -hmm. This is an image we've already seen, but you can see this constant negotiation with industrial features, very standard products being used in order to stage another way uh, the life. As I said, it's full of prosthetics. In this case, the voice of the lips allow very clearing between one side of the intimate and the other side of the, private, uh, of the public sector. And the repertoire he uses, uh, that goes back <coughs> to our understanding of the assembly, uh, which would be that of the construction framework, the industrial repertoire. As I said, all these pictures are basically industrial products that have been not adapted, but very slightly adapted in order to be used into, uh, into social housing development, which is something which is absolutely unthinkable in Switzerland right now. It would be hardly thinkable today, probably, in Europe, uh, let's say. But it shows how... Uh, let's say, catalytic, this approach can become, I think, in the case of such a program. Yeah, prosthetics, of course, as I understand, people are extremely happy that these doors can totally open, but they're not insulated, so when there is a lot of rain, there is water in the apartment, it's freezing in the winter, it doesn't matter, it's still a fantastic project but they accept to live with it. You can see here of the, all the hinges of the fire station, <coughs> doors that have been used. <coughs> and one last thing, because I think it's a funny feature of the project, I, I called it a daily life edit, because as I said, the Jean Nouvelle project has much of his desires within it. And the irony of it is that every inhabitant of this, the Mauser's project, uh, that has been accepted as, a, uh, as an inhabitant of the project, had to sign a paper saying he would not touch the existing substance. And this, <laughs> this is absolutely insane. I heard an anecdote that was told by Jean Nouvel for his housing project in New York in Soho. So let's say you, 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 you decide to buy an apartment, it costs probably several millions in Soho, in a project by Jean Nouvel, yet you're not allowed to choose your curtains. <laughs> And he, he got it to the point where he actually forbid everyone who bought the apartment, his own, his own apartment, you're not allowed to actually project anything of your own uh, desires onto the apartment. It was the same in the Mausers, of course. <laughs> this is a joke. Look what it has become. And I think, contrary to Jean-Nouvel, I think this is a very interesting feature. In other words, people are going to project their own lives onto expectation by someone else. And this is a, gives a very joyful aspect to the project. Uh, you will see some features where a passage had been, they put uh, shelves. The kitchen that we saw before, more ethic, less aesthetics, looks very much different. Uh, people tend to measure their kids also. They paint the handrails. They use the terraces as storage spaces. It's a very joyful life there. It's, it doesn't look like a piece of architecture that has been frozen into time, and that's what I praise also about the project. It's been able to transform itself along the time. Plants growing where they were not supposed to grow. You can see here light coming through being obstructed by plants and furniture. The amount of attention being applied to an existing uh, feature. Nevertheless, this remains a very beautiful project, I think, an extremely convincing one. Uh, the Mausers in numbers is very simple. It's 10,400 square meters for a budget of 6.1 million euros, which is somehow pretty amazing, I think. That's it. Thank you. Of course, for seeing that you would not show your own work. Yeah. I knew that in advance. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, I 
I was here there, four months so ago. Huh? Yeah, no, of course. I mean, he's yeah. the master in the hiding. Uh, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How do you say that? Hiding.